What's going on, everybody? If you're joining us from LinkedIn, welcome. All right, if you're joining us on Zoom, amazing. Glad to see everybody. As you're, as you're starting to join us here on either platform, just so you know, if you're on LinkedIn, I won't be, like our team will be monitoring LinkedIn. We'll be interacting. If you've got comments, et cetera, drop them in there. Uh, same thing on Zoom, obviously, as you're, you know, kind of joining us now, if you've got questions, if you've got, you know, any type of insight, et cetera, hit me up, let me know, and we'll, you know, excited, excited to go kind of go live and, you know, talk to everyone about sales technology, right? I think a lot of companies are out there investing in sales technology, spending a lot of time on, you know, what's the right tech stack or they hear from a sales leader buddy, they're like, oh, we got to get Gong or we've got to get XYZ Seismic or whatever the tool is. And so I'm really excited for, you know, Brandon, Brandon's been with us for a few months, but Brandon has got extensive experience across multiple companies, investor, former VC too, just in, you know, what makes sense that at what stage, et cetera. And so, you know, I'm super excited for the conversation, Brandon and us kind of you know, getting into it for everybody, because I know that this is so, so top of mind for, for everyone out there. Very excited as well. And just, you know, that's as excited as the Brandon will get. All right. Brandon doesn't, <laughs> Jake, I, I will go high, you know, and it's good. It's a good, it's a good yin yang. So, uh, you know, look, I think a lot of people, um, again, that this is just such a topic that I feel like is so prevalent, especially now, right? The economy, people are worried about the economy. They're like, hey, we've invested, and I'll get into some of the stats, you know, we've invested, uh, you know, time, money into these tools, like what makes sense. So I feel like a lot of this is just more timely than ever. So again, as you have questions, you know, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat as well too. And we'll just, you know, we'll kind of, we'll get into it. Um, so again, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, you probably already know who I am. So, you know, I, I you know, run a sales consultant, a consulting company, Scaled. You probably signed up through one version or another. Brandon, I think it could be helpful, man. If you want to just tell people a little bit about you and, and your background as well too, you know, cause you've done a lot of, you know, amazing things. Well, thank you, Jake. So great to meet everyone. Uh, my background is really split up into three parts, as you guys can see. So I've done everything on the sales side, started as an SDR, worked my way up as an AE, uh, ended up being able to manage a sales team. Same thing on sales operations, led sales ops at a few different companies. And then also, as Jake mentioned, um, have a VC background as well. So I've gotten to see sales tech from many different angles and hopefully it's helpful of bringing that perspective to this conversation today. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think again, like just seeing all different facets and, and again, different companies too. I mean, uh, you know, Brandon's not tuning his horn enough. Like he's seen companies that have went from, you know, here to here and then hyperscale as well too. Um, and so again, like we're really excited to kind of talk you all through this. If y'all don't know scaled, you know, we do quite a bit of work in the sales technology consulting space, uh, sales process consulting space as well too. Um, so that's enough about us if you don't know. So let's, let's jump into this. So it's interesting. It's that I thought I was closer to 2000 at this point. Um, the sales technology landscape, I think for most sales leaders is just, it's too much. And most sales leaders, and the funny part is, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the marketing version of this. The marketing version of this is like 8,000 tools. And so if you want to know where sales tech is going, you, you can look at the marketing, you know, version of this, which is kind of each, um, mar sales always kind of follows marketing from a technology and process standpoint. I think for me, when I look at this, um, there are so many tools out there. And I think so many companies, you hear about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, oh, wait, this company now. And, and for me, it's not even the next thing. It's that, hey, this company that you thought of for this thing now, six months later, does also this thing. And you've already invested in three other tools that do, you know, versions of this. Um, and so I think for a lot of people out there, they're in a big reason we're doing this is to help all of you kind of understand, like, what makes sense? And we're not going to be, we're not going to cover everything to be very clear. And if, by the way, if you work for one of these companies and you're like, but Jake, you didn't talk about this, like my bad up front. Okay. We're going to try to cover as much of the, you know, a uh, thousand plus solutions that exist. Uh, and Brandon, I know you got to take on this too. 
I do. And, and Jake, you are right. There were more companies in this space. It was closer to 1,500, 1,400 a few years ago. And I think a lot of these companies are starting to feel the pressure to consolidate. So as our budgets haven't changed with tech, a lot of RevOrgs budgets haven't changed, but these companies keep popping up. You've, you guys have probably noticed companies acquiring others in a, in a similar space and bundling their offerings so that you can get, like Jake mentioned, five problems solved in one, whereas that tool prior might've only done one or two things. So this landscape is changing a lot. It's overwhelming. There's a lot in it. And we're hoping to help you guys prioritize and make sense of it all. That's right. I mean, it's, there's a reason I take and then force Brandon to take, you know, multiple demos a week as well too, to try to stay on top of, you know, what we feel is, you know, mission critical at whatever step. Um, and, you know, look, I think this is just, you know, kind of a, a by the numbers call out, which is, you know, more and more companies, I did a talk back in January and I had sales leaders raise their hands and there were 80% are spending a thousand dollars. You know, I, I got to tell you, there are, at least 30 to 40% that are spending $1,000 per month, if not 1500 per month on sales technology. And I think, you know, we've invested a ton in these productivity and efficiency and effectiveness tools. And it, the number is not going to, again, as, Brian, as Brandon said, it's going to continue to consolidate. But what these tools can do and the promise of them is still there. And we all know that sales technology is very, very important. Um, but I still think sales leadership, we are, we're continuing to kind of build teams the way that we've built them in the past. And we're continuing to build teams where it's like, yeah, technology is the thing, but the reality is like, there's a big promise that can come with them. And as, you know, we kind of get into, you know, kind of the topics here of, you know, what to do and at what stage makes the, the right sense to invest, um, data continues to be a thing, right? We've talked about data. I remember hearing this years ago, like data is the new gold, right? Or data is the new, like, yeah, like liquid, like whatever it is, but it's in sales, you know, we kind of tolerate a level of, you know, lack of hygiene um, across it. And, and we really struggle to quantify what that actually means to organizations. And what does that mean to a sales org when, you know, data or data definitions are, uh, struggling or not clear. Uh, you've got misaligned goals, you know, meaning you've got marketing that wants to do this. You've got sales development reps or SDRs or BDRs or XDRs, whatever you call them that want to do this. You've got sales that wants to do this and you've got customer success that wants to do this. And what happens is with a lot of sales technologies, one is they don't get shared across, you know, departments. Uh, they don't get integrated across departments. And, you know, you've got tools that, you know, this team is using that could be used by this team, but they don't know the use case, et cetera. And so you've got all these kind of misaligned goals in terms of people going out and making their own purchases. And even with the promise of RevOps, which I feel is like the 2020, 2021 buzzword, ABM was like the one before that, we're still seeing that the goals between departments is, is not just blurred, but also nobody's talking. And so you've got, again, customer success, investing in certain tools, sales development, other tools. Uh, and then again, building a system that's difficult to use is so many of these tools are deployed from rev ops, sales ops, sales enablement, a sales leader, people that aren't in the day to day. And what happens is not only do we clunk, you know, clunkily put it together, we then build it in a way that make sure that we as leaders get the data that we need necessarily, or we get what we want for our own little silo, not thinking about the customer journey. And so, you know, Brandon, we're getting ready to dive into the, the details here, but I'd be curious, you know, you work with hundreds of clients, you know, how, how this plays out, et cetera. But I think these are all the, go the, the issues that when people reach out to us that they, you know, kind of highlight one, if not all of the above. I think you're exactly right. And the other thing to add to what Jake is saying is a lot of these tools on the, on the pro side have made it easier to integrate and get up and running. So you've got managed packages that are packaged pretty, pretty neatly where an admin, you don't need coding skills and developing skills to get these things up and running. So what we're seeing to Jake's point is a lot of companies that end up adopting tech, becoming more siloed 
because there's less interdependency to get a tool up and running, whereas five years ago, it might have been a different story. Today, you can pop it in, set the permissions for your team, get everyone going, and you, you don't need to have as much cross-functional conversation. So we hopefully want to help you guys um, you know, avoid getting into those scenarios where the tech has progressed to a place where it makes it easier to fall into data silos in your organization. That's interesting. Honestly, that's it's a, it's a I think it's a use case that people don't think about, which is I'm purchasing the technology. I'm being promised to Brandon that it's going to be so easy to implement. It's so easy to get started. And I think in sales in particular, we've got such a bias for action of like, cool, hey, we bought this thing and we we get it, you know, like, let's get it started. And then the sales reps telling us to get it started. And then the enablement or the ops person that has to actually implement it is like, uh, okay, like I'll do my best here. But again, I'm not, I'm not able to take in the goals across the departments. I'm not able, I'm not able to take in the different use cases. And so that's kind of how we, you know, end up in this, you know, kind of world. So, um, you know, let's talk about this concept. So sales technology, a lot of conversations out there around it. And again, we're not going to get into the who's better conversation on this, uh, you know, on this conversation, but, you know, happy to kind of walk through kind of the, the partners that we use. But let's talk about how you should think about your, your sales tech stack. You know, how do you think about it as, hey, I'm an organization, I've probably already invested at least $1,000 a year. I mean, I would say most organizations have invested, you know, quite a bit more. Um, how do you think about this framework you know, Brandon, on scalability, repeatability, predictability, and, and how organizations and, and individuals who are in sales operations or sales leadership should think about, you know, again, kind of their, their, their progression in terms of investing in tools. Absolutely. So this framework that you guys are seeing, we're going to lay the groundwork for it, but the backstory and the context here is that this comes from looking at hundreds of companies, hundreds of companies, and looking at the good movies looking at the bad movies and trying to find the pattern of the companies that scaled up in a way that you'd want to replicate. The companies that didn't have issues with, with data integrity or pipeline visibility, all the things that we all run into. We tried to synthesize for you guys into the simplest framework we could. And that's where this is coming from. So before we jump into it, the scalability on the left, um, and if you jump back one more, Jake, I just wanted to make sure we call it out. Like Jake mentioned here, like this lays the foundation. So we, we took all those, you know, thousand tools that you saw on that slide and we're kind of putting it into these three buckets. So the scalability is laying the foundation and we'll talk about which tools fall into the scalability bucket. Repeatability tools are helping you do more of what works. We'll talk about the tools in that bucket. And then the predictability are, are helping you essentially extrapolate insights from um, what you've got going on in your pipeline. So those three buckets are what you saw on that slide that Jake showed of thousands of tools. We're essentially putting it in three categories for you to help you think about them and also to help you prioritize them. So anytime you look at new tech now, you guys will be able to put it in the lens of which bucket does it fall into and you'll know exactly, okay, I know I need to focus on this one or I know I can deprioritize the other one. So Jake and I came up with this analogy and hopefully this is helpful to contextualize this. So again, we talked about those thousands of tools that are out there. We put them into these three buckets. These are the three buckets that we see companies that scale up really well, kind of put them into. And the example we're gonna use here is we wanna build a high-speed train. So let's assume we've got um, train tracks to lay, We've got switches and signals and lights to put up, et cetera. All of those things are on the left. That's the scalability. That's the non-sexy tools that we'd have to work on first. And if we put that in a rev work perspective, that is the stuff that just lays the piping and the infrastructure for us to be able to have a pipeline, to be able to move deals across the funnel, right? The next thing, if we were doing this, if we were building this high-speed train, the next thing we'd naturally do after we laid the tracks, the signals, the switches, the lights, and, and built some of the stations would be to get into mapping. We'd say, okay, we need train schedules. We need to know which line goes where. We need everyone to have some sort of repeatability around 
what the train does, expectations, how do we build one train and then copy and paste that to three others so that we can keep this thing growing. So in the sense of the rev org, this is us trying to find tools that if we were to hire from 10 reps to 100 reps, what processes can we just plug and play that our playbook, our sales process, our methodology, everything just gets reinforced and codified into some kind of playbook or some kind of system. So those are our two buckets so far. The third part, if we were building this train and going back to that analogy, we need a way to monitor it. So our trains on schedule, are, are we hitting our, our targets of making sure we've got enough passengers to um, satisfy demand, et cetera. So all the analytics that will go into that to help us know, are we doing the right things? How do we course correct would go into building this high speed train and bringing it back to the revenue org analogy. This would be all the, the sexy kind of insights and analytics tools, the things that would sit on top that would tell us very early, are we going to you know, hit forecast? Are we on the right track? Are we on pace? So those are our three buckets. Jake and I are showing you these early so that you guys can orient yourselves as we talk through this around a new framework for you to use to essentially take all those you know, thousand tools plus out there and start to put them into a, does it help me lay the foundation? Does it help me do more of what works? Or does it help me um, get insights and analytics to course correct my, my pipeline? Yeah, and I think, you know, Brandon, when I, you know, I look at the last one, which is predictability, right? And if I think about how we think as sales leaders and how you think, it's like, we all want predictability. I get it. Like we all want to this, this engine, right? We've all read predictable revenue, which kind of started this whole thing. And so it's like, we want to get there. And I think what, what, what I love about this analogy is it's better to go deep and get ingrained and build scalable first versus we want predictability. Like you said, with, you know, five, 10, 20, or even a hundred plus reps, whenever we haven't laid the foundation. So I just think it's a great kind of framework, you know, to build with, to build in. So when you think about um, the stage of company that you're at, and, and again, just think of these kind of, even if you're not working at a tech company, think of these as kind of your own evolution around technology or your own evolution on scalability, et cetera. You know, how do you think about these three pieces, you know, three pieces where it's, you know, best practice, workable, infancy, you know, and, and Brandon, how did you kind of like put this together in terms of why you need what, when? Right, yeah. So the, these categories of workable and infancy and best practice, on the next slide, we're gonna talk more about them in detail and hopefully show another, um, we're big on analogies, so hopefully show another analogy that lets them hit home. But to Jake's point, like these are general guidelines that you see on the series A, I should be here, you know, series B, I should be here, et cetera. But when you think about those, those guidelines, think of infancy as starting with, you're just walking. You're, you're able to put together an MVP of something that will help you um, get the job done. So this is you know, things in Google Drive, spreadsheets, nothing's really figured out yet. You've just got the bare bones. When you get to workable, now you're going from walking to running to riding the bike. So you might not have the Ferrari level tool yet to solve this problem, but the systems are humming along and you've got a way to do it that doesn't require manual workarounds. You've got a system in place. You know that there are areas as you scale up and as you grow that you're gonna have to add to it and beef it up. But for the most part, you've got a really solid workable tool configured well, that's gonna help you grow. And, and the best practice piece here obviously is getting to flying, right? And that's, that's saying we've got the best in class tool for this problem. We've got the best configuration for our needs. There are no manual workarounds. If we wanted to pull the data out and look at it and see what's going on, we can do it like that. It doesn't require someone's, you know, a spreadsheet that sits on someone's desktop and that person's out of office and you can't get the data you need. So when you think of this approach and when we talk about being at infancy or being at workable, et cetera, think of this kind of framework to say, we're not all the way there yet to the, to the, you know, flying the plane, but we've got something in place that's going to help us have a line of sight to get there. Yeah. And I think so many companies, again, 
instead what they do is they go out and buy the plane and then, or they buy that and they're like, Hey, we're ready to go. And it's like, no, 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 we've got to make sure we've got the tools in place and they're working properly. And I think that that's, that's so much of what I see is that we invest in these tools and we think that, like you said, the APIs are easy. You know, the rep told me it takes 10 minutes for me to plug it into Salesforce. Um, and then we skip ahead and we're like, oh, well, I heard about this tool and this tool and this tool. And it's like, no, 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 like take a step back. So so let's start early here. Let's start about, hey, and, and by the way, it's interesting because, you know, we call this kind of, you know, your early pre-series A, but look for a lot of you out there, maybe you're even like, what do you mean? I've never heard of these tools. <laughs> and so I think this is, you know, I think about this as a journey regardless of the step that you're at. And, you know, you were very keen to call this out too, Brandon, whenever we were talking about this early. Um, and so for a lot of organizations, you know, think of this as kind of your, your building blocks, your scalability blocks. So if you look at this and you're like, well, JK, look, we're not one of those companies that's a pre-IPO or a publicly traded or, you know, wherever we fall, it's more about like, like Brandon said, it's kind of like, what are the things that I should lay the, the foundation, the tracks on first, you know, as I go forward. So, you know, Brandon, question for you is like, you know, how do you think about why these tools and not necessarily the specific tools or the names in here, you know, kind of fit for this, the train track, you know, like laying the train tracks I'm early on, you know, why do you, you know, how do you see these tools working together? Why is this kind of the, the go-to? Absolutely. And I think to Jake's point, like, when we, when we show you guys these tools, <clears throat> we're not necessarily endorsing these as the tools. So when you see the logos, they're more illustrative. Also, when you see these categories, it's not exhaustive, right? This is us looking at what for most companies would be considered core and your specific use case may be different. You may have tools that are listed here that you aren't, you know, aren't specific to your motion or uh, tools that we may have left out. But to that point, if you guys notice the scalability bucket here at this level of the evolution, you want to be at workable. You see that, that little light bulb at the top right. And what we defined as workable was you've got the tools in place. You've got configuration that doesn't require manual workarounds. So when you think about the CRM, when you think about enriching your database, having prospecting tools where reps are able to go find email addresses and phone numbers that don't require them to do it manually, You've got sales engagement tools where you can automate some of that follow-up. This is really making sure that you're nailing it on the workability side for scalability. And you're getting to a point where you, you can look back and say, you know what, I'm ready to kind of exit this and move to the next evolution when I've got my basics working well. They might not be at the, at the Ferrari level yet, but you've got a workable system and you've, you've focused on the core stuff. The other piece you guys will notice is on the right and in the middle, We've got these as, as infancy. And really, here is your time to try things before you, you know, invest in heavily in repeatability tools. So before you go out and get you know, a, a conversational intelligence tool like, like Gong or Chorus or something similar, or before you go out and, and do a full-blown learning management platform, this is your time to really figure out what works, write that stuff down. It's OK if you've got things in Google Drive here for reps to pull from. It's OK if you've got reporting that's just the very basic crm reporting here you don't have this sort of you know um, uh, polished layer on top of it but our, our communication here is that the focus is really about scalability at this phase before you can move on to the next yeah and i'd be curious i mean like feel free everyone if you if you don't mind you know feel free to kind of drop your tech stack like if there are tools on here that you're like I can't live without, and it doesn't have to be the tool name, it can even be the category, but I think that, you know, it's it's so interesting because you put this together completely independent of, you know, kind of us talking originally, you know, months ago, and um, it, it's so true. It's like, you know, I kind of think of this as like, do I have a way to get clean data? Yes. Do I have a way to act on that data? Yes. Do I have a basic way to report on what happens when I took that action? And I, I, you know, I couldn't agree more. And I think the other thing that I'll add here, and, you know, we're not going to talk, you know, the, it, we're going to do a follow on, um, you know, kind of conversation to this around adoption that like just adoption is so key that, you know, there's so many companies that invested, I'll go back for a second in these tools. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we've done that. And it's like, no, 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 you haven't. You've, you've bought the tools, but, you know, Brandon or myself, we can't make the tools work for you. The vendors aren't magic either. And so if, I think for a lot of you, you know, just kind of keep that in mind of like, 
you might be looking and be like, yep, checkbox, we did it. And, and a lot of you need to think about the option as well too. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is kind of a fun one. Like, how do you think about this one, Brandon? Oh yeah, this is, this is a fun one. So we hear this a lot. And the thing that we hear is with companies looking to move fast at that early stage is we'll come back to getting it right with Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever your CRM is. We'll come back to building out the piping with to routing leads properly, to enriching our database. Right now, what we want is some kind of analytics layer on top, right? Because that's the fun thing. That's the thing that's really cool to look at. And we see a lot of companies skip over the infrastructure things here. And, and the fact here is that the easiest time, the simplest time for you to get that stuff right, where you don't build up a lot of workarounds and tech debt and, and have other systems then play off of what you've built out in terms of tech debt is up front. And the other piece to this is that that analytics tool that you layer on top won't be able to show you anything if your foundation and your infrastructure and your CRM just doesn't work well. So if it's not set up to give you full visibility from lead to close, no analytics tool is gonna sit on top of that and show you anything meaningful about your, your funnel stages. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, yeah, you can go and report on this, but the data or the workflows that you might build are just like not, they're not helpful. You know, you've got raw data, but are you getting insights? And exactly. I think that's right. That's the point, you know, of like reporting and analytics. This is a, we got a, a really great question that just came in that said, you know, is it better to revamp infrastructure issues or start from scratch, right? It's, it's hard to stop running the day to day and fix the issues that keep coming up. Um, and so again, we'll go into kind of the next, the next phase here, but how do you think about that? You know, how do you think about, well, Jake, I get it, but the plane is flying. The plane is already, I, look, I already bought a plane, you know, or like I've already, I've already bought this and like, Hey, you guys are telling me this. And, and like, you know, I think, I think candidly, most leaders or rev ops or sales ops people kind of know, like they deep down know, like, Oh, this is not going to go like, this is going to be mediocre at best. So, you know, when you, and again, I know we're going to do a whole other kind of follow on to this around adoption, but just so, you know, people who are out there, you know, how do you think about that? But like, okay, I hear you. This is the foundation. Yeah. You know, again, like you showed the, the tracks, you showed the map and then the, the plane and the like, well, shit, you know, we're somewhere like here, you know, over on this side of it. How do we, how do we kind of take stock and then make sure that the plane can keep flying, but we're kind of fixing it, you know, midair. Yep. So we can keep going on that example to answer that question, uh, Jake, that we, that we shared in the beginning, which was around the train tracks. So if we have a high-speed rail and it's running and customers are getting on it, it's fully functional, it's up and running. You guys will notice if you, if you live in New York, you'll definitely know this, that the work on the train tracks never stops. There's always this sort of um, disruption a little bit of, hey, we're, you know, we're revamping these tracks or we're modernizing these tracks. So we're not saying that you have to disrupt the business to do that, but what we would recommend to go back and revamp would be to just give a higher proportion of the RevOps work that you would do in each of those three buckets for your company, just allocate a higher proportion to go back and revamp and know that it's gonna take time, but you're still gonna continue building the plane. You're still gonna keep working on repeatability and predictability, but you're gonna give a larger share of time, effort, thought, planning to go back and figure out, hey, Let's revamp these pieces. So before we got into building out this reporting layer that we were going to spend a lot of time on, we need to give 50% of our time back to setting up HubSpot marketing automation platform and Salesforce to talk to each other, to have to say that we have clear milestones in the CRM that we can track from MQL to SQL to close, those sort of things. So just knowing that it's a checklist, you're going to just have to give more time back to revamping as opposed to putting it toward maybe some of the other things in your stage of growth where you might've been putting more time toward repeatability. Yeah, I think that's such a great call out. It's, you know, I think of it like in any, any part of your business, et cetera, if you just spend a certain amount of time just understanding, like you said, you know, they're always work. I take, you know, I think about like train, I'm like, yeah, that sucks, right? It's like, it's always under construction or they're skipping this stop or whatever it is, um, you know, but that's so true. It's like, look, you don't have to, you don't have to go back and necessarily do this big revamp. Maybe for some of these tools, you need to, 
I want you to just think about that. You want to invest it as maybe a company tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in a sales technology. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, uh, you know, hey, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure on the ROI. It could be that you need to do that daily maintenance. It could be, well, you know, look, you, you went through the deployment process before. You, you might have botched it. You might have not done it properly. There are times when, hey, maybe you got to shut down the, the, R, the R from Rector to, you know, Brooklyn mm -hmm. or something, right? And like, you know, I think for a lot of people out there, most of it, though, I think to your point, it can be done with maintenance. And for a lot of you out there, you know, who are thinking about this, you know, and, and I think that the other piece is you, you build in a mindset with sales technology and, with, and even your sales playbook. Candidly, it's the same on the enablement. Side. It never ends. You know, it's just like your website. Your website's evolving. Your, te your tech stack, it's, it's always getting better. And I think we have a tendency in sales to say, well, we deployed it. We deployed the tracks. We deployed the trains. We deployed the schedule. Done. You know, as opposed to, you know, we did all of that. And now we've got to make sure we're doing the small things to optimize on a regular basis. So, so to kind of not digress too much, you know, how do you think about this next phase? So I've started to, I've invested in these tools, this kind of core tech stack. They're working, the trains are at least running a little bit. You know, how do you think about these additional tools kind of coming in to get us to, into, you know, starting to get into repeatability? Yeah, this is the step. If we can point out any one most critical step, this is the one that we see companies derail the most. So in the beginning, like if you showed that pre-Series A or just the beginning of your evolution of doing this, we see some focus on scalability. Once, to Jake's point, you start getting the tracks going, the train starts moving, there's a tendency to leap ahead and just, you know, you've got product market fit at this point and just start getting into predictability. And notice how we've kept that one as, as infancy at where it's okay to have the bare bones and MVP level sort of reporting and analytics at this stage. So the critical part about this is making sure that you're getting to absolute best practice on the left. So on the left side, being able to look at these kind of core tech stack categories and say, yep, we've taken care of these. These are configured very well. There's no manual workarounds required. So for instance, if reps are sending out documents, proposals, e-signature, that part is seamless. There's, there's no sort of disconnect between there and going to finance to make sure you can reconcile it in your ERP. You've got lead routing down, you've got engagement down. So getting the bucket on the left to say that we've, we've checked off the box here, we feel like we have really good training tracks in place is most critical about this step. The second part is allowing yourself to move forward into repeatability here. And we see a lot of companies make the mistake of saying, I don't have everything figured out yet with my ICP, where we have product market fit, but we don't know if it's this is going to be the motion that we do forever. Therefore, we're going to wait to do content management, to, to embed the sales process into, into the CRM, to even start thinking about account tiering or calling out for reps, the ideal customer profile. So we see a lot of companies wait too long to even start thinking about the repeatability tools, but we're recommending at this stage, you get to some workable phase. So it's okay to start iterating on the sales process because a lot of these tools, frankly, make it really easy for you to, to pivot. It's really easy to reconfigure and to continue iterating and finding what works. So the reason we call this out as important is typically a company around this stage is going to have that product market fit. You're gonna know what's starting to work and you're gonna start hiring a lot of reps and you're just going to need a system that's going to allow you to not rely on your rock stars for quota attainment but you need a system that's going to allow you to bring in five new people and have a content management place for them to pull marketing collateral from have the sales process sitting in a crm so it's reinforcing it for them beyond just the initial training again guided adoption your tiering accounts so you're starting to do the things that are going to help you bring new people in successfully and have them be ramped up, productive uh, at, a, at a workable level while you still continue to iterate and figure out what works and tweak your messaging here. Yeah, and I think what some of the things you're calling out are, are critical because other people are like, but I, you know, look, we, we just want to skip ahead. We want to be predictable and repeatable. And it's like, look, you have 10, 15, 20 salespeople, maybe 30, 40, you know, like the number is kind of arbitrary. 
if you don't have a predictable business at this point, and, and you know, Brendan uses the term product market fit, uh, my friends, I'm here to tell you, if you're doing 5 million in revenue, you still have not established product market fit. You're at the beginning, potentially, right, of understanding what it could be. And, and I think it's important for a lot of people out there to understand, like Brendan said, like you get the left, right. And then you start to think about these other tools to add on because early on, it's about figuring out what works figuring out, hey, what are the routes we should be running, et cetera. And then, you know, you're doubling down on some of this. So I just think it's such a, a great, a great call out. Yeah. And this, and that was our, our fact and fiction here, which was again, like Jake mentioned, waiting until you perfect your messaging and perfect the sales process. Maybe you've got something like winning by design coming in and you don't want to touch anything with tools until you have that, you know, um, that training. And we're here to tell you the right time is yesterday to just start thinking about putting these things together. It's not too early. These tools are purposely configured to be very easy to update because for companies, this stuff changes all the time. The stuff you need to train new reps on in your learning management platform, like a, like a lesson lead by seismic or something like that is going to change all the time. So getting these things in place, you're going to, you're going to be, you know, in a much better spot to continue updating them than waiting too long and you know maybe skipping ahead like jake mentioned to predictability before you then have to come back and revamp this sort of stuff so saves yep. yourself a lot of pain yep for sure um how do you think about this readiness check yeah so this readiness check we we kind of alluded to some of these but again the, the purpose of this one is your your infrastructure your train tracks the, that sort of piece around scalability is solid and you're at best practice. So the way to check that is to say, if, if I were to ask you pull a lead report for me from lead to close, one report, not a workaround sheet, not in a, you know, a Google Drive sheet that sits over here that has to then go into here. It should be something you can pull from either your marketing automation platform or CRM where you can see this stuff all the way through. Your sales process sits in the, in the CRM at this point. Your uh, account prioritization, if that's something that's important to you, is sitting in the CRM to tell reps, this is our ideal customer to prospect. And this is, an, this is a customer that's not ideal for us. And again, when you bring new reps on at this stage, you've got something in place where you can train them, reinforce, upskill, and continue to do these things with a workable state of repeatability where um, this stuff isn't, isn't manual anymore and this stuff isn't just all in one person's head to train to train the team yeah, it's funny somebody dropped a question and then I, I think you answered it like as before you even knew you were answering it which is more around um you know full funnel visibility i think and again we're not going to we're going to we're not going to get into marketing attribution and first touch you know necessarily in this conversation but um I think a lot of organizations just need to think about just, I mean, I think it's more of just like a, just so you know, you know, look, there are very simple and easy ways. If you're using some of the, the tools that we have in the scale, scalability, sales engagement platforms like Outreach or you're using a marketing automation tool like, you know, Pardot or HubSpot, there are very easy ways actually to tie this all together through Salesforce. You know, someone takes this action, we then automatically put them in you know, to this thing. And then we're able to track the data that happens between people that were at this stage that we took sales action on, et cetera. And I think a lot of this for certain companies is just a lack of knowledge sometimes around, you know, what's possible. And obviously the work that we do, you know, is important as a part of that. So um, I think you answered the question live, which is fantastic. So let's get into kind of the, the later stages here. So let's get into the kind of predictability and you know yeah. how you know it's right and how you know like okay we're implementing these other tools around repeatability we're now getting into predictability so if you, if you guys remember we said that last stage of that a to b that sort of we're making our transition from scalability to repeatability was the most critical that we see companies either go left or go right once you get to this part we don't want to say it's smooth sailing but because you've done the work of setting the train tracks and because you've, you've gotten to best practice on your repeatability tools, at this point, bringing on the, the fun predictability stuff, whether it's something for your customer success team, like a Gainsight or PlanHat, or it's uh, the, the 
analytics and reporting like we listed here, like an Insight Squared, a Clary, and a Viso. This is the part that you're, you're essentially sailing right into best practice and you're sailing into being a company who scaled up the right way. So this part becomes extremely intuitive. You've done the right stuff on the left. You're doing the right stuff or you've gotten the best practice in the middle here. You're implementing you know, a few other pieces to, to round out your tech stack, like learning management, bringing that in, conversational intel, et cetera, finding white spacing and accounts. Layering on the, the, the reporting here is gonna feel super seamless. And again, you notice how we're calling out, you don't have to be at best practice yet because you just essentially started to bring it on, but it's gonna be so simple to get it up and running because you'll, you're able to see your pipeline um, from a full visibility perspective. You have no sort of loss of data, if you will, with being able to view that stuff. So when you layer this on, it's gonna work as it's advertised to, as opposed to at this stage, getting into the reports and, and analytics and then having to go backward and go back into fixing the infrastructure. Yeah, I think that's such a great call out. We're, I know we're gonna get into exceptions here in a sec. Um, and, and for a lot of you, you're like, well, you know, look, we've invested in some of these tools and, you know, I said it up front, Brandon said it up front too. It's, it's not that you can't have integrated some of these before it's, you know, when are you going to really see the blip, right? When, you, when are the tools going to really help to make an impact? And it could be that some of these can help you to do it sooner, just depending on the stage that you're at and the, you know, the, the use case for the tool. But I think for a lot of people out there, I think even, you know, probably a lot of people look at conversational intel, they're like, wait, Gong? Gong is at this stage versus it's the very first thing. It's like, look, just like any of these tools, if your team is ready and they're gonna use it and they're like, we know how to coach to, we've done all these things. So not only do we know how to coach, we know now know how to coach to conversational intelligence or whatever that ends up being. It's like, great, like go for it, like do all these things. Um, but I think so far, we, we, you know, many people look at these technologies, like, you know, you mentioned up front, I plug them in, they fix a problem. And I think, you know, what I love about what you put together, Brandon, is it's just such a, a great way to think about the stage that I'm at. And again, company, you know, fundraising is a part of that. But when should I really think about these tools giving me that, you know, that blip Absolutely. as opposed to, you know, well, everyone else has gone, so why don't I? <laughs> Again, not, to, not, not, not to pick on Gong. Gong's great. Um, so let's talk about exceptions, right? And, um, you know, feel free, everyone, we're going to wrap up here in the next five minutes or so. Feel free, drop any additional questions that you have. We've already had some really great questions kind of pop up. Um, you know, let's talk about exceptions, you know, and how, yeah. you know, you think about it, et cetera. And it's probably easy for people to make exceptions too. They even look at this like, no, 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 we're at, we're at scalability. No, 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 we're good. Um, as they think about exceptions, but you know, when is the right time to think about, you know, I'll just kind of go back real quick, you know, okay, I've, I've invested in some of these other ones. Like wh when should I know, like maybe something that's in the predictable bucket, I actually am ready for early or in the repeatable bucket, I'm early or maybe vice versa. Like what are the things that you think about that are, you know, critical as a, a sales leader or sales ops leader to think about um, yeah. when to make these exceptions? Absolutely. So I think Jake brought up a great one with exceptions, which is, you know, your business, you know, what your team is ready for exceptions come here around what we haven't talked about, which is your people. If you have the right people in place, whether it's sales management, you've got a really strong rev ops leader, whatever it may be. If you've got the right people in place, you can go forward with some of those, like Jake mentioned around conversational intelligence early and some of these other things. So the way to think about this is not necessarily as a one size fits all t-shirt, if you will, but as a guideline that we've seen from patterns of other companies that have helped them stay within the guardrails to grow in a way that scales, as opposed to a limiter of saying, well, we want to get into these other pieces, let's call it of repeatability, but this guide tells us that we shouldn't yet. <laughs> you know your team. So if you if you see that you've got the right people in place that can that can make it effective, whether it's sales managers, rev ops, et cetera, then you know that you know it's time to pull it forward. Um, the other exception here is around, and I think Jake mentioned it, just around the series of growth. So we're using these as as um, very general um, kind of frameworks so that everyone can kind of maybe gauge you know where you are. But you also know that. Um, 
growth stages and funding stages don't follow these very neatly. And you're going to know whether or not you should maybe peg yourself as a, as a company that feels a little bigger or feels a little smaller based on the maturity of your rev org and based on the maturity of your product. So those are some exceptions I think we would call out here. And the, and the last point it. is- I mean, real quick, though, I mean, how good is Jeff's yeah. slide here? I mean, Jeff with crushed the, with this. The money, with the money on yeah. fire. I mean, it's such, a, <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a good slide. Shout out to Jeff on our marketing team for this. But That money yeah, on fire sorry. is how I feel at the gas yeah. pump. So, um, but the last point we'll say on, it, on the, the exceptions is there are tools that we didn't list and categories we didn't list. So totally your, your sales motion may include gifting like a Sendoso or something like that, where that's really important to your, to your, your prospect. It may include, you know, um, other pieces around an, a power dialer or whatever it may be. So also Absolutely. recognize that we didn't include the whole world, but hopefully you felt like we included some core pieces. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great call out. Um, and then, you know, again, how do you think about this? Again, there's the exceptions. And I think a lot of people, you know, if we kind of go back here for a second, I think a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've invested on those tools on the right, but, but we're the exception, right? And so, you know, again, when you think about this flip side, like, how do you think about you're just really being honest with yourself about where you actually are? Yeah, I think the honesty here is in configuration. So you might on the flip side have the tools and just check the box of, yes, we have Salesforce, but I think all of us know who maybe have used Salesforce as a CRM. There's a lot of different ways that that can be configured. It can be your best friend. It could be your worst nightmare. So we think that you will know on the configuration side, and that's where we can help where Jake was kind of showing the, um, the mini tech diagnostic that we offer, where we can help you get into the nuance of those questions and help you know if it's configured well or if there are areas to improve yeah i think that that's yeah it's so spot on becca just texted me by the way brandon she was the one who suggested that's that uh picture so ah, shout out to, credit, to becca credit, on the, 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 mar the marketing side um and then i think look for all of you i mean hopefully you see from the content that i put out and that we put out and you know brandon puts out um we need brandon to put out more content as you can see his you know stuff is pretty gold um you know we really want to get, give back, you know, as a part of this too. So we're going to drop a few links in here, you know, to just book a conversation. Um, again, I think, you know, from this deck, and we're obviously going to disseminate the deck as well too. Um, you know, again, it, it's, it's such a tough, you know, when you're in the moment and you're looking at the tech stack, you know, I, I really think what, what, what you had said, Brandon, is just so critical, which is it's, it's so much of this is about the deployment. You know, it's not the technology's fault. It's not, you know, chances are the tech is fine um, or, or it's possible. And, and I think as a sales leader, for anyone out there who's a sales leader, maybe is, is listening to this later, it is in 2022, you as a sales leader cannot outsource your knowledge of technology to a sales ops or ops person. Because I feel like it is becoming more critical than ever that if you don't know what's possible, if you don't know, wait, this tool can do what? You are going to continue to build sales orgs in the vision that you built them 10 years ago or even five years ago or even three or four years ago. These tools, I'm telling you, I mean, Brandon and his team have to keep up. I do my best to keep up as much as possible. They're evolving so quickly that that same tool that you're like, oh, outreach, that's an email tool. You're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> now it can do these other 17 things. And so I just really want to encourage everyone out there that hopefully this helps you to understand what should be top of mind for you, one, um, when to potentially invest, um, how to think about your investment, but the deployment and how you configure is the, the X factor that no matter what tech we told you to invest in or we talked to you about it at the scalable or you know repeatable or predictable, if you don't invest in the config, if you don't invest in the pull through, it's why, you know, it's interesting. It's like back in the day, you know, and Brandon, I'm sure you're familiar. It's like you used to, you know, you'd buy an ERP system, an SAP or an Oracle, and you would spend 3X that amount to implement it. You buy Salesforce and you'd spend, you know, X amount. It's interesting. And I'm not just saying this because we're a services company, but now it's like sales tech to implement. You're like, ah, maybe we'll spend 10% of that to, to see value here. Um, and so as, as we kind of come to a close here, you know, Brandon, any kind of, that's my kind of, you know, diatribe here about just like, 
you know, you got to invest the time to get these, whether you work with a company like ours or not, it really, you know, I, you know, we just want yeah. you to get it right. You know, what are some maybe closing thoughts that, you know, you have on, you know, sales tech or you know, anything we haven't covered? So closing thoughts, there was a question that I want to make sure I answer. Oh yeah, definitely. About, yeah. Someone asked about guided adoption and said, Hey, I'm not familiar with these tools. And I think that's a great segue for what you just said, Jake, the guided adoption category that we put in here where we called out Spec It, we called out Walk Me, we called out another, uh, I think it was Easy Movie. That category you can think of as, to Jake's point, of helping you have a better configuration and launch of any tech stack tool that you're bringing in. So an example, those companies will sit as a, as a layer on top of any tool that you want to bring in. Let's say it's outreach. Let's say it's, it's um, Zoom Info, whatever it may be. And they will essentially do a setup wizard style walkthrough for a sales rep or whomever of how to use the tool. So if you put in some use cases, some scenarios, some questions for them to kind of like an FAQ section and someone says, hey, I'm stuck. We have this new tool, but I don't know where to go next. Where you might have lost um, adoption for that tool in the past, where someone just decides to keep going and call it a day. You can essentially, with that guided ad adoption category, have just-in-time training when someone needs it that says, we got you. This is exactly, we're going to click right through on your screen and show you exactly where to go and where to click to get done what you need to get done. So that's a category we put in that will help you from all of your other tool perspectives of getting the adoption that you're looking for, to Jake's point, having that return on investment. Um, and we see companies that use those types of tools as being super successful on having uh, launches that actually matched what the technology said it could do and, and you know, having that sort of ROI. Yeah, I love that. And make sure again, feel free, share the link. We put Brandon's uh, calendar link in there. He's got a day job too, my friends. So book some time <laughs> with him, with the team. Um, again, sales technology. And I think again, let's, it, it just is kind of, it's very, we're, we're kind of saying this very similar things, which is it's just is evolving so quickly. And I think for any leader, anyone listening, if your question is like, hey, is there a way to do this? Yes, is probably the answer, right? That, that these tools exist to not automate the things. And I think what's happened with sales tech is we've, you know, not necessarily abused it, but we definitely have looked at it as a, a opportunity to do more. The reality is sales technology is meant to help us to do more, but also to do higher quality different other things. And so if you're wondering how to get more ROI, you know, book time, you know, with brand and the team, again, it's not just because, you know, our team is not just focused on how to implement the tech. It's about, you know, the change management and other things that go into it. So Brandon, appreciate you, man. I think this is a great conversation. Hopefully all of you out there had a ton of, ton of takeaways, book time with the team. Uh, you know, feel free to DM myself, DM Brandon, uh, follow him on LinkedIn, trying to get him more followers. So follow Brandon on LinkedIn as well too. Um, because again, I mean, he just, he gets this like, you know, very few people. So Brandon, appreciate you talking us through it, man. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully this was helpful. Uh, I, I think so. I think there's a ton of takeaways for folks. So thank you everyone. And we will see you next week. Uh, if you are in San Francisco, make sure to sign up for an event. Uh, we've got an event coming up. We also have an event next week in New York as well. So if you're going to be in person, fantastic. We're going to be doing a part two around this, around adoption. Um, so make sure to sign up for our newsletter as well. So thanks, everyone. Appreciate you. We'll see you next week.